Good afternoon. This is Eric Mucklow from headquarters of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, this is a part of our sustainability and energy webinar series. Uh, this series uh, happens every couple of weeks uh, during the summer months, and we have various topics from the industry and our own uh, people and staff out in the field to give us uh, information that can help us with the design and construction of our, of our buildings to uh, take our knowledge base and technology further. Uh, if you're looking for uh, AIA credits for learning units or CEUs, uh, we do uh, batches of five presentations. And there is a quiz sheet available on the website shown on the screen. You can download the quiz form if you're interested and uh, fill it out. Email it to Andy uh, T. Meyer, uh, email address at the bottom of the screen, or also in the global address list on your Outlook for the Corps of Engineers employees. And he will uh, see to it that uh, you get credit. Uh, for participating and getting your CEUs. Uh, with that, we also have Lori Awakawa. She is from the Pacific Ocean Division out there in Hawaii. Uh, and she will be giving us a brief overview on their uh, lighting center of expertise uh, that is also related to the daylighting effort. So with that, I will turn it over to Lori. OK, uh, thank you, Eric. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Laurie Arakawa, and I'm the program manager for the Daylighting and Electrical Lighting CX. Uh, thank you for taking the time to participate in this webinar as we learn more about efficient lighting design and lighting control systems. Okay, back in October 2011, OPOR 2011-72 was issued and required each MSC to establish a Regional Technical Center, or REC, R-E-C-X, for Energy, Sustainable Design, and Life Cycle Cost Analysis. Headquarters USAFE assigned specific sustainable design and development technologies and strategies to the RECs. Daylighting and electrical lighting is one of the focus areas. Uh, since sustainability is an integrated process, the RECs are working together with Headquarters USAFE with CERO and Huntsville to provide guidance on implementing sustainable design and development for the Army and our customers. The Daylighting Lighting CX can provide guidance and consultation for implementing daylighting and lighting strategies in buildings. If you would like more information, uh, please contact Mr. Reynolds Chun, who is the technical lead for the Daylighting and Lighting CX. His information is provided on the slide. Okay, so why is daylighting and efficient electrical lighting so important in a building design? Mainly for energy saving. As you can see from the pie chart shown, lighting makes up approximately 40% of a building's electricity consumption and 25% of a building's overall total energy consumption. This next slide is a more detailed look at the contribution of lighting when sizing HVAC equipment. This chart came from a study done for schools in Florida. When looking at the contributing factors for calculating a building's sensible cooling load, aside from the load due to the occupants, the next largest contributor is the lighting load at 23%. So, if we reduce the energy used to power the lights, we reduce the energy required for the lights as well as reduce the energy needed to cool the building. By reducing the electrical lighting in a building, we make the building more energy efficient in two ways. First, we reduce the ener electricity and energy consumption for the lights. And second, we reduce the air conditioning load needed to cool the spaces which heat up because of the light. With this, I will turn the presentation back over to Mr. Eric Muckler. Thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, with that, I will talk a little bit about Mr. Schreiner. Uh, he has over 20 years' experience, and during which he rose to the president of two different firms. He started his own business developing consulting company as well as other ventures. And in 2007, he joined Sunport Industry as their CEO. So he will be giving us his presentation on daylighting with deep well skylights. And it's going to talk about what daylighting is and the available technologies and strategies to provide daylighting and how high-tech daylighting units work with their automated integration into electric lighting. So the benefits of daylighting, both economic and environmental, are presented in detail, including detailed financial analysis. 
lastly, the incre increased productivity of people utilizing daylighting is also going to be discussed and related to the mission of our armed forces and the facilities that we provide. Uh, with that, I will give it over to uh, Mr. Schreiner. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about daylighting and very specifically with about deep well skylights. Energy conservation strategies, they all have the same goal and that's to spend as little as possible on energy and save the environment. And to do that, the objective is to reduce fossil fuel based energy consumption and there really are only three basic strategies. One, use alternative energy sources such as solar, wind, wave, geothermal. Number three, energy efficiency behavior, which involves personnel training, motion sensors, etc. And the second strategy is use energy efficient equipment. And we're going to be focusing today on daylighting. Why energy efficiency? Because it is an existing, it uses existing proven technologies. It's readily understandable by the users, quickly and easily installed, and very cost efficient versus some of the other options to reduce energy consumption. Daylighting, it's simply the use of natural sunlight to illuminate, illuminate the interior of the building. And there are a number of different daylighting technologies out there today, and, and this uh, diagram only covers a few of them. Windows, obviously, are the most common, but there are also daylighting wall systems, roof monitors, solar pipes, collection distribution systems, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What we are going to focus in on, however, is top-down daylighting. And what is that? It's through the roof. And it is the most effective form of daylighting for two reasons. One, it provides light all day long. You don't have to be just on the south side of the building. Secondly, it illuminates the entire building interior. Skylights being the most common type that everybody is uh, familiar with. But there's a, sh a paradigm shift in the whole skylight industry right now. Skylights used to be thought of as an architectural enhancement and typically they captured about a 50 percent of the sunlight mostly from directly overhead very poor insulator 1.5 to 2r value you get an intense light ray rather than a, an evenly distributed uh, uh, lighting and they're all standalone units what's happening is is the movement toward high performance skylights or hps's and these are integrated with the electric light source. And they're far more technically advanced than a regular skylight. They are designed to capture anywhere from 80 to 85 percent of the available light. The R value is 20 plus, and, and the good ones are up near 30, uh, which is equal to or better than the R value required for the roof. They evenly disperse light throughout the interior and most importantly they are integrated with the artificial light. There are uh, several different high performance skylight types. One is the deep well which we're going to focus in on. And second is a tubular skylight. Solar tube is, is the most common brand uh, for that and mirrored skylights which have a sun tracking electronic unit uh, that, that brings in the light into the building. Deep well skylights, DWS, this is what they look like. Uh, from the outside on the roof, they look very similar to regular skylights, a little bit different shape lens and certainly a different material. And inside they are boxes or wells that bring the light into the building and in a uniform manner before they actually distribute the light. How does its skylight work? Uh, the first thing is um, 
they have an advanced lens that captures the sunlight even at dawn, dusk, or on cloudy days. The materials, uh, there's several different types using being used. There's a prismatic type, and there's also a, uh, a new material called satin ice, which is uh, micro uh, balls of acrylic all of which is designed to pick up the low-level light early in the day, late in the um, afternoon that is normally not um, gotten in through a regular skylight. Inside the well, number two, is it is lined with highly reflective specular aluminum. This is 99% reflective. Uh, it's that reflective so that when the light comes in and bounces around, you don't lose any of it back out the light well. And uh, down to number three is the diffusion lens. There are a number of different types, but they're all designed to diffuse it evenly throughout the room. And those are variable depending on the characteristics of the room. And fourth, over by your electric source, is the control system. And this is a critical element in that there is a light sensor, and a photo sensor, and often a motion sensor which can override the photo sensor. And it only turns on the electric lights when they're needed. It's entirely automatic, so you take the human aspect of turning the electric lights on and off uh, out of the equation. And lastly, inside, uh, at the bottom, uh, there is an option with many of these deep well skylights that have the actual high efficiency electric lights built in. So this is particularly important when you're doing a new construction. You have just one item to, to put in for your entire lighting needs. And that's right there, um, and which saves uh, significantly on uh, costs. There are two types that have integrated lighting. One is internal. And you can see on the left, uh, the, the fluorescent lamps are interior to the light, to the, uh, the light well. Um, and these are used primarily where you have hung ceilings and you have a restriction on the size of the light well. On the external, they're put on the outside simply because it increases the efficiency of the fluorescent or LED lighting that you're using in conjunction uh, with this. And this is what a, a system looks like. And they really are deep well skylight integrated systems. And that is key. This is the new aspect of this particular kind of technologies. On the left, you have existing lights. So you can, if you have high efficient electric lighting, there's no sense of taking them down and changing them out. You leave them there. And you put in the deep well skylight and put the control system on the existing light. And again, it works with a photo sensor and a motion sensor uh, and turns on those lights only when exterior lighting is required. On the right is the uh, type of system where the lighting is internal to the, to the light wells. And again, they operate all automatically. This is the, uh, a picture on the left of uh, capturing the light at dusk. If you were to go into this building right now, even though it is at dusk, uh, it, the, there's sufficient lighting to light the interior building. On the right-hand side is the even distribution profile, and it compares the regular skylight clear lens, which is just a beam of light going onto the floor, and that beam will move throughout the day, and you can actually see it, versus a lens uh, of uh, this type of unit, which is uh, fairly uh, dispersed and even. Very, very important to this technology in a relatively new development is the solution of the heat transfer issue. If you have ever been in a room or have it at your home, 
a skylight, uh, you'll get the light in, but if it's during the winter, for example, uh, your your uh, furnace will have to work overtime to keep the room or home warm because the heat is leaving, just like through a chimney, out the uh, skylight. Uh, the newest of the deep well skylights prevent that. And the solar heat gain coefficient, which is the heat from the sun, is uh, mitigated. The U value, which is the inverse of R value, uh, is very, very low, so that it, it tends to be around that R30 uh, that I mentioned before. And when you're using deep well skylights, the percentage of roof penetration is only 2 or 3% because each unit will light or illuminate anywhere from 500 to 1,200 square feet. And so you're not um, uh, having uninsulated roofs in, in very much of the entire building. This, by the way, also allows you to put these in, in, in conjunction with a PV system, a solar panel system, uh, very easily, which many people are doing. Maintenance is virtually nil on these deep well skylights. Uh, there is a new water penetration system on most of them. They're usually uh, tripled as this shows on the diagram to the right. People think about skylights, they think about the ones that were installed in the 50s and 60s that leaked like sieves. Nowadays uh, that does not happen and they're usually warranted um, to the fullest extent of the roof. The, the better ones are made of aluminum for durability and also lightweightness for the installation. The lens material has a uh, high VLT. Light wells are very accessible down below because if you have the type that has integrated lighting in them, you need to be able to change the ballasts and the lamps uh, fairly easily. And most importantly with deep well skylights, there are no moving parts and very, very, therefore very, very little maintenance is required. Most of the deep well skylights have custom design options. Uh, they can be made almost to any size um, at no added cost because of the technologies of laser, laser cutters these days. Um, it's just a matter of a programming uh, issue. So that if you've got an old smoke vent that's six feet by two and a half feet, that they can be made to fit that uh, versus a four by four standard size. Diffusion lens and materials I have mentioned before. Uh, there's several different types of material, uh, all of which work very, very well to diffuse the lighting. You can also have a UV coating on this, and that prevents any color fading, food spoilage, uh, bleaching of clothing, etc. From an architectural point of view, if that's important in the building, they can be anodized or painted a selection of colors. They all come with, if required, a fall protection grid. And in some cases, in presentation halls or in, in the schools, there's a motorized shade system so that the room can be darkened. This is why deep well skylights uh, work very, very well. This happens to be um, in the Northeast, specifically in Connecticut, where we are located. And the lights are off an average, completely off, 7.6 hours a day uh, during the year. Importantly, in that May, June, July, and even August period, the lights are completely off uh, during for over 10 hours a day. Now, this varies, obviously, with the intensity of light that you require. Um, in the building. But this is the period when there's brownouts, blackouts. This is the period when um, electricity is the most expensive and yet the lights can be completely turned off. In a similar manner, this is the KW, the demand, 
again during the summertime, um, drops to zero, eight or nine hours a day. And this is why in many states there are significant incentives, and I've seen them as high as 75% on these projects um, to put these in. The power companies um, love these units because they do save considerably, not only in consumption, but lower demand during that critical time of year. And there, uh, the Lighting Research Center up at Rensselaer in Troy, New York, did a study a few years ago, an independent study, testing the efficacy of deep well skylights. And you see the four of them in the picture of the cover. Even though they were kind of Rube Goldberg-ish, um, they still experienced a savings of about 45% uh, of the lighting costs uh, over the course of a year, which is very, very significant. The applications for deep well skylights are uh, numerous. Uh, any low-rise construction, in other words, any single-story building, it can be new construction, existing structures, skylight replacement, uh, smoke vent replacement, or whatever. And in all types of roofs, built-up roofs, membrane roofs, metal buildings, it matters not. They can be put just about anywhere. And importantly, they are a very, very good source of lead points. And there are, uh, are up to 14 points toward the Green Building Council's lead certification uh, program. Where we highly recommend a, uh, a lead consultant to uh, analyze this because every every uh, single building is different, but there are opportunities in indoor environmental quality, energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, and innovation in design. The process to go about to see whether these are appropriate for your buildings is very simple. You do a, an audit, and it's a very simple audit of the building, the size, reflectivities, uh, and most importantly, what light levels that you need in the building. And you also measure the foot candles in the existing building, or if it's new construction, um, the IS uh, will tell you what the recommended light levels are, and the hours of operation. All this information is put into a fairly sophisticated computer model, and uh, it will come out and tell you the layout, how many units there are, and then we'll show you the light levels um, throughout the building if these were to be installed. As part of the uh, cost of a project, you've got obviously the uh, project, the uh, units themselves and the control system, but also shipping and installation becomes an important consideration. And here's where the, the better um, deep well skylights have really done a, a terrific job in the last few years. They've made them very, very lightweight and compact. Uh, they ship them flat, and uh, they're very, very easy to assemble. The part count is low in the basic uh, units, uh, seven pieces. Rooftop assembly is essentially five minutes. Many of them have integral curbs for easy installation. Simply cut the hole in the roof, drop it down, and flash it, and you're done. Importantly, in the, in the units that have integrated lights within the system, uh, low voltage wiring is used, which does not require a licensed electrician at a high cost. Most of the wiring can be done by anybody. And uh, we always recommend certified installers to maintain the roof warranty. At the end, you add all that together, and you should come out with a spreadsheet that looks similar to this. And you will have, we have, it's a, this happens to be a 20-year cash flow. Uh, you're showing the energy savings in this particular building. This is not a large building, um, but you'll see it. 
Maintenance is also a factor because if you've got light bulbs currently in your facility or currently on the drawing board that have a 10,000 hour um, lifespan, but now you're only using them 40% of your time, yeah, you're going to extend the actual years that those lights will be used. And same thing with the ballasts. Uh, you don't want to worry about the tax credit or depreciation, but uh, at the end you get a financing uh, cash flow and a net cumulative cash flow. And in this particular case, you can see this small buildings was saving $11,368 the first year. And at the end of 20 years, they've saved $629,355. Also on this type of spreadsheet down below is a payback period. In this case, it's 2.16 years, um, which is a very, very reasonable um, payback period. There are really two benefits to deep well skylights. One is the economic, which I've spent most of this time on. And this will cut the lighting costs 40 to 80 percent. Where you've had uh, warehouses, for example, as was mentioned early in the presentation, about 40 percent of the electrical consumption in a warehouse is uh, due to lighting. If you can save 40 to 80 percent of that, you're talking about a very, very big savings. Increased productivity I will talk about in a minute. But the second part of this is environmental. And that is reducing fossil fuel emissions simply because you're not turning on the lights and you're not burning electricity um, used to power those lights. A typical 25,000 square foot building using 50 deep well skylights, I use the minimum um, uh, coverage on those, will save over 70 tons of fossil fuel emissions a year. And uh, again, this is the other reason that there are many, many states and many environmental groups that are interested in deep well skylights. In terms of uh, what the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers gets involved in, uh, we looked at the Strategic Sustainability Performance Plan, and goal two in that plan is sustainable buildings, uh, the reduction in energy intensity. The target is a 30% reduction versus 2003 by 2015. To date, this is through 2012, um, that has reached 11.5% reduction. Uh, deep well skylights are a quick, easy, inexpensive means to get that number up quickly. And they can be used in all the types of, many of the types of buildings that, uh, that the uh, core is involved with, all single story. And uh, you can see them there. We, uh, actually, schools are uh, a big part of what uh, deep well skylights are, are being installed in, which I will show you in a few minutes. And energy security uh, is, is an issue with the military. Uh, and when you're in a hostile territory, the last thing you want to do is have somebody cut the electrical power and not only can't you operate, but you're in the dark. Uh, if you have a building um, that does have deep well skylights in it, at least you will have the safety of having the building lit uh, during the day. There are, I mentioned, a number of other benefits, performance benefits, that would come into play with many of your types of buildings, warehouses, and maintenance facilities. You will increase worker productivity. You will have fewer errors, less absenteeism, uh, and fewer breaks. Why is that? Because you don't have the flicker of the uh, lights going on which uh, give you headaches and eye strain, etc. Better morale, it's a safer environment, and better quality control. There are numerous uh, third-party independent studies, many of them out of academia, but also from some of the lead power companies in the United States um, that have been able to quantify uh, these uh, benefits. 
offices or your headquarters or, or company buildings, again, better morale, less absenteeism, fewer breaks, less eye fatigue. And you can spend longer time at the computers. If your computers are lit by daylighting, which is 100% full spectrum lighting, it's just much easier on your eyes uh, than it is under electric lights. And I mentioned schools. Um, there's loads and loads of tests out there uh, that have been conducted in schools lit with daylighting. And it shows that math tests progress is 20% faster, reading tests 25% faster, improved test scores, reduce bad behavior. Yes, uh, not just kids, but all sorts of people behave better uh, in natural daylighting. Enhances teacher uh, retention, reduces absenteeism. And an interesting one, you can continue to teach even if the power uh, goes out because your classrooms are still lit. And this is a proven technology. The technology is at its base has been around for almost 20 years. It's just recently in the last five or six years that significant uh, technological uh, innovations have been made to deep well skylights, um, particularly the integration with the uh, electric lights. And uh, they are being used in a number of different ways, as is pictured here. If you actually walk into a building that has daylighting, uh, a lot of people don't realize that, that it is daylighting. It looks a lot like electric light except for things look a little bit better, again, because of the full spectrum uh, color rendition. Uh, we fully expect, uh, and we are starting to see, uh, significant uh, financial benefits accrued from the use of these uh, deep well skylights. Uh, it has a major environmental pack, very cost efficient to install, and critically, no operating costs. So we see a very explosive growth in, these, in this particular technology uh, throughout not only the US, uh, but in the world. And uh, that summarizes uh, what deep skylights are about and uh, their benefits. And I'm certainly open for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Schreiner. Uh, this is Eric McClough again. I have opened up a question and answer uh, block on the right-hand side of the screen for our yep. participants. There's a text entry box in the very bottom of that block uh, where you can type in your questions. Uh, once you enter them, uh, they will show up on my screen, uh, and my screen only, and I will uh, read, uh, consolidate uh, repetitive questions and, and read the questions uh, aloud for the sake of the recording uh, so we can have a, an organized uh, uh, answer uh, Q&A answer session here. Um, so the, uh, the first question uh, that I have is, um, you mentioned uh, the, the examples that were um, single story buildings. Is there a practical limitation to the, the height of these deep wells? Uh, that's a good question. Um, the answer is no. Uh, and there's, there's two parts to that answer. Uh, we've actually put them in two-story buildings. Uh, you can make the deep, the well itself, up to 15 or 16 feet long. The key is that you have to use the 99% reflective aluminum on the inside so that your light loss is uh, mitigated. We see this a lot of times in warehouses where you'll have a two-story section inside the warehouse for offices, et cetera, and they want to light the second, the, the first floor with these, and you can drop it down uh, through the first, through the top floor and into the second, and uh, and it works just fine. The second part of the question is: we have done up to 50, uh, 55 feet high ceilings. Um, I mentioned that we. It can change the lens. It's not just the material, but it's the shape of the lens uh, on the inside. If it's relatively flat, that beam will come down fairly straight and won't have a lot of diffusion. If it's a 13-foot ceiling, it will be very bowed and will spread it out to the side. So it really, uh, each project is has to be looked at separately. 
and um, the, the, the type of lens that we use is, is uh, selected to fit the, the height of the ceiling and the number of units uh, also comes into play here. So you can, you can put them in anywhere. We're, uh, we're actually working on a hangar in the uh, state of Connecticut and they have very, very tall ceilings and they'll have uh, very plenty, plentiful light there. But uh, this is a question from uh, Minnesota, I believe. Uh, <clears throat> what happens when you have uh, two feet of snow in the middle of the country? Uh, how do you reconcile that? That's a good question. We're here in the Northeast, and certainly this uh, past winter we had uh, a lot of snow. Um, there is a, it's much like a, a photovoltaic cell on the roof. There is a slight heat coming out of that, uh, uh, of the lens, of the top lens, and it's just enough to continually melt the snow that hits it, and uh, you don't get the piling up on top uh, to block uh, the unit. Now, if you're in Minnesota, northern Minnesota, where you don't get a snowstorm of 18 inches, you might get 36 inches, and it's coming down real fast, and uh, it's very, very cold, and it's not melting. Um, two things. We, in the design of these units, you can make the upper part of the unit taller. So instead, the normal uh, height of these units is about uh, 18 inches, including the lens on the top roof. But we've made them up to three feet tall. So we look at the snowfall, and, and um, if you're getting these two or three feet things, we just make it uh, taller. And it doesn't affect the, the efficacy of the units at all. Secondly, you would be surprised how much light comes through snow. Um, I, I remember we had uh, one of the states that we, we put one in. They actually came down at the tail end of a snowstorm to look at the installation. And there was snow on top of the units, and yet there was a lot of light inside the uh, facility. Okay. Uh, speaking of weather, we have a question from out uh, in the ocean in Hawaii. Uh, are there special considerations or optional features that should be considered for installations uh, to withstand hurricanes? Yes. Um, our units are uh, conformed to the Miami-Dade Code, which is the standard uh, for hurricanes. Um, I don't remember the name of the hurricane, maybe Andrew, when they came by, they changed that code. It's very, very tough, and it will withstand uh, significant uh, winds, and ours do conform to that code. Okay, and another one. Um, what uh, what size? You mentioned a four by four typical skylight, but uh, what what is the range of flexibility when when they talk about uh, the width of a skylight? The you we can make them here. I, I put back on the, uh, the the photograph, and you'll see a couple of different sizes there. You'll see the right center. Um, is a, I think that's 20 inches by 3 feet. Uh, we can normally go as small as 24 by uh, 2 by 3. There is no maximum size. We just installed some in a school which had old, old smoke vents that were very large. These were 3 feet wide and 13 and a half feet long. So there is no limit. We can put any size. The, the, normally, the size restriction is dependent upon the spacing between the purlins or beams. As long as there's room there, we can, we can customize them to get the maximum uh, square footage out of each unit, which is cost efficient for whomever we're installing it for. OK. Um, this is Eric Mucklow again. I'll give a couple more seconds here for uh, anybody else to enter in questions. There are none in the queue right now. Um, so uh, otherwise, it seems like a very uh, positive approach. We've talked about um, coupling daylighting 
uh, with automatic electronic controls uh, in past webinars and, and briefings um, because they, they are uh, a good symbiotic relationship between multiple technologies. Uh, you wouldn't obviously want to have a skylight up there and then have your electric lights just on full bore. You wouldn't be really saving much of anything. So um, again, I would like to uh, thank you for uh, joining us, uh, Mr. Schreiner, and uh, as well as uh, Lori Awakawa uh, for giving your introduction on, on the Lighting CX. And uh, not seeing any more questions, I guess that will wrap it up for today. Um, uh, Andy T. Meyer will be sending out announcements for our next webinar, uh, which will be on the uh, uh, email system uh, for those who are subscribed. Uh, thank you for, again for participating. Thank you.